Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's Goat Roadshow. We have a cracking lineup for you and it's everything about goat, what you need to know about the industry. So welcome to all of our speakers. So tonight and first up, we have John Falkenhagen, and I'm gonna pronounce that wrong, apologies, John. Um, John and his wife, Beck, run a dairy goat enterprise, Ideal Veal at Menengi um, in South Australia. They stock their operations um, that are exported across the globe with bucks being sent as far afield as Indonesia, Philippines, China, and Malaysia. The Falkenhagens have recently begun a 10 year plan to transition into meat goat herd. And John is currently the president of the Goat Industry Council of Australia. He's also the president of the Goat uh, Dairy Goat Society of South Australia. So we're very fortunate to have John here tonight. He's also presenting with Katie Davies. Katie and her husband, Ed, run a harvested rangeland and semi-managed semi operation near Wilcannia in New South Wales. She's currently the Vice President and Secretary, Secretary of GIFA, the Goat Industry Council of Australia, and is the New South Wales Farmer Goat Industry Committee Vice Chair. John and Katie tonight will provide an overview of who GIFA and GERDAC, the Goat Industry Research Advisory, um, Research Development Advisory Council, what they are responsible for, and before explaining the requirements of TAGS, um, differences between harvested rangeland and semi-managed rangeland systems, and also the movement of animals. So please welcome John and Katie to present to us first up tonight. Good evening all. Um, it's my task to take you through a bit of an overview of GAICA. So GAICA is the Goat Industry Council of Australia, and we're here to represent and promote the interests of the Australian goat producers. Function as a specialist goat industry organisation with concerns for the livelihood of all goat producers. Carry out activities necessary to advance the goat industry. Collect and disseminate information concerning the goat industry. Maintain a high level of liaison and cooperation with its members relevant government departments, authorities, and local and state federal levels, and promote and develop the agricultural and pastoral industries of Australia. Excuse me. So the membership of GAICA is made up of the four state farmer organisations listed there. So New South Wales Farmers, Ag Force, Livestock SA, and VFF. And we also have four production um, commodity-based members, um, dairy being represented by Dairy Goat Society of Australia. The meat position currently is vacant and we go to an annual open call on that. Um, Fibre is Mohair Australia and Rangeland is Partial Association of West Darling. And AMIC uh, sits at the table as an associate member. Um, all of these committees uh, all of these organisations have consultative committees um, of which their job is to uh, get information in and out of GAICA. Um, so any producer has two ways to get to GAICA, either through their commodity group or their SFO. Um, each member nominates a representative uh, to attend GAICA on their behalf. Um, and there's a select selection criteria that has to be met. So that's done um, at a member level and the member representatives are required to represent their member's policy, engage on behalf of the group and report back to the member and act in the best interests of the goat industry. So this is where I said about consultative committees um, and information in and out of GAICA through the member and through their committees. GAICA does not receive any levy monies from LRS and all levies are paid and collected and distributed by LRS. GAICA represents the industry at a lot of things. Um, ARMAC being one, SafeMate, ISC, Think, NLS and Traceability, GERDAC, which we'll hear about later tonight, um, industry task force on LSD and FMD, which you would have heard a lot about through the media lately. 
livestock traceability design initiative, which is all about EID rollout, uh, NFF, supply chain task force, Anymark, goat data collection and tracking, and trust me, the list goes on. Um, and we're there to represent your interests. So this is about industry partners and industry representation. So Armac at the top of the tree, Red Meat, um, Red Meat Australia Council. I've got that wrong, Katie. Red Meat Advisory Council. <laughs> Um, and then we've got all of the peak industry councils with ALIC, Alpha, AMIC, Cattle Council, us, GEICA, and sheep producers. And then we have all of the uh, partners. So the Australian government, AMPC, Live Cork, MLA, and AHA, some of which you'll hear from tonight, uh, and some of which receive industry levies for industry investment. Um, so projects and, and policies, uh, as a peak industry council representing the industry of all, uh, all goat producers, animal health and welfare, so I think standards and guidelines, uh, research and development, um, industry specific um, research that can grow our industry, uh, trade and marketing uh, to try and continue to, to grow our market. So producers can continue to get a good price and continue to, to grow in size. Biosecurity, we've all heard about as first and foremost in our current environment and exports of both live and meat products or goat products in general. Um, thanks, John. Uh, so levies. So meat, fibre and dairy goat producers contribute um, to the research, um, development and marketing activities, and that's through levies. So the livestock transaction levy is applicable to any animal transaction. So if you sell that animal to your neighbour, if you sell it through a sale yard, if you sell it to an abattoir, if you sell it to a depot, if you sell it to someone on the box um, through an auction system, um, any transaction of that goat, there is a livestock transaction levy attached, and that's 37.7 cents a head. So GAICA is responsible um, and our charter is to oversee and make recommendations to the minister for the distribution of that goat transaction levy income, which is what funds NRS, the National Residue Survey. Uh, it funds Animals Health Australia and also funds uh, MLA and each of the commodities red meat commodities pay into those bodies. And that's how industry is funded, uh, except the peak industry councils, as we don't receive any of the levy funds. The goat fibre levy is based on a 1.5% um, sale value of the fibre sold and is payable to agri-futures. So GEICA doesn't oversee the fibre levy, but we work in conjunction with agri-futures in various projects and co-leverage to ensure that each part of the industry gets the most bang for their buck when it comes to levy investment. Sorry, just got a problem here with the slide. So the transaction and fibre levy investment. So as I said, GEICA oversees the levy investment uh, and it is collected by the levy revenue service. So, um, Meat and Livestock Australia or MLA, AHA and the National Residue Survey receive levy income and then the fibre levy is through AgriFutures. And you'll see there that the Cattle and Livestock Transaction Levy User Guide and how to complete your monthly returns online, that's available through um, agriculture.gov.au because it is the vendor that will be paying the levy on behalf of the purchaser unless you're going through an abattoir or you have an intermediary such as an agent that is going to be collecting the levy and paying it on your behalf. But as a producer, it's your responsibility to ensure that the levy on the transaction animal is paid. So this is the breakdown of the 37.7 cents. So MLA receives um, marketing at 10.5%, uh, sorry, 10.5 cents. 
Um, R&D is 16.7 cents, and that is matched by the federal government. So we get basically double that 16.7 cents ahead. AHA receives 4.5 cents and NRS is 6 cents. And as we discussed, the 1.5% of the sale value of the goat fibre goes to AgriFutures for R&D. John, I think we're back to you. So the next couple of slides is a bit of an overview of the industry and where it's at. Please bear with us as we know some of these um, numbers are a little bit older. Um, but trying to keep track of these is uh, A, costly and, and B, pretty hard to do. Um, so again, we're pretty lucky at Geica where we, in, we represent goat meat, dairy products and fibre and rangeland. Um, so if we move on... So the last uh, survey for um, dairy goats was that farm gate values between 20 and 27 million in 2017. Um, and uh, we're milking about 31,000 head with a total herd of about 46,000 head producing 17 million litres annually. Um, there's a bit of a distribution, of course, the large dairies in, are in Victoria where most of the manufacturing is, but they're certainly spread across the country. And as we can see, most of our product in Australia goes into cheese. Um, we all like to have cheese. There's a little bit into milk lot in the milk powder and a few others, re-yogurt, a um, bit of soap and other things like that. We have our fibre industry, two primary uh, breeds in Australia, Angoras and Kashmir. Um, Kashmir um, premium fibres being luxurious and soft, 11 uh, to 20 micron. Uh, world production of cashmere is about 3,600 tonnes. And just trying to quickly see, but we don't produce a lot here in Australia, unfortunately, but there's certainly room for the industry to develop. Mohair um, has come back off of its big peaks, but I know that uh, our our body representing mohair at the table is, is certainly trying to increase the production of um, mohair in the country. Uh, so goat meat is, as you all would know, is most widely consumed meat in the world. Uh, we are one of the largest exporters despite being relatively small in production. And it's the quality of the meat that Australia produces that is underpinned by our biosecurity and traceability systems, which harks back to the levy and how we actually fund those R&D uh, activities, plus your animal health surveillance activities as well. Um, and 90% of the production is from a rangeland goat enterprise. Uh, so supply chain for 2021, um, the, the biggest processes of, or the biggest um, off-farm transaction of a goat is directly to processes. Um, and then of course, the registered goat depot, especially in the harvested rangeland uh, industry. Uh, registered goat depot was a great success for the goat industry in getting that registration process through and actually leading in the red meat industry with, <clears throat> excuse me, with regard to regulation around a depot process. Um, sale yards, as you can see, what, less than 1% of goats are processed from a sale yard. Um, we have seen an increase in the processing of animals out of sale yards and especially over the <clears throat> Auctions Plus platform and similar platforms to that. Um, we don't consume um, all of our meat in Australia. It's 95% is exported. 
um, but the domestic market is increasing um, year on year. And uh, we have very small number of goats that are exported live um, for breeding um, and for slaughter. And that information comes from the industry data collection and um, industry committee, which we actually have um, an immediate past president of GAICA attends. And also we have a current member of GAICA that sits on that committee, giving us that great in insight into where actually the industry is headed and what our forecasting numbers are to try and assist with levy direction to ensure that we're getting the best levy income expended, sorry, levy investment that we can. So as you can see here, oh, sorry, um, giving everyone um, a rough idea of where the goat production is in Australia. That far western section of New South Wales is the biggest producer, but also now into southern Queensland, uh, especially with exclusion fencing. Um, and we're also actually seeing a resurgence of the goat population in Western Australia with uh, the advent of exclusion fencing and going back into the semi-managed herds within Western Australia, which is a great thing to see. Um, GERDAC. So the Goat Industry Council of Australia um, made a decision that we needed an advisory group to assist GAICA with the technical support with regards to R&D uh, and extension and adoption initiatives and investment of the levy. So GERDAC, which is the Goat Industry Research and Develop Research Development and Adoption Committee, was established um, to assist with levy investment direction. So GERDAC is actually administered by MLA and funded through MLA. Um, the committee meets to review the funding proposals, uh, also review proposals that have been previously um, accepted and are underway and review stop-go positions within those projects to ensure that levy expenditure is getting the best that we can for it. Um, the goat industry levy isn't particularly high, but by having this extra layer through GERDAC, um, being able to review those projects. Um, the committee de delivers on independence, um, quality, objectivity and transparency by having that committee. And the committee will then provide recommendations to GAICA and MLA regarding the, the, the GERDAC committee is of up to eight members. So from all sectors, of the industry the committee is made up from um, and there is an application process to actually apply to become a member of GERDAC uh, and that is advertised and there's terms of reference. GAICA actually holds two seats with on GERDAC which is separate to the committee um, and that is just part of the process that is in the terms of reference. So MLA provide the leadership on investment <clears throat> and the alignment of the RDNA priorities with Red Meat 2030, which is the overarching direction document for the Red Meat industry on where we're going for the next 10 years. Uh, we also have the opportunity to have a maximum of two consultants from various sectors of industry or expertise to ensure that if GERDAC needs the assistance in that RD and A space that we have access to all the people available to ensure that levy investment is the best it can be. Um, so the role of the committee members is fairly, was very important um, and they do have an influential leadership role within the industry uh, and also ensure like the people that, are, that come onto the committee and apply for positions um, have that really good deep understanding of the differing production systems within the industry and actually the commercialization, the systems and how RD and A can assist those processes and those part <clears throat> processes um, to go forward with that levy investment. So from that, um, we actually have two rangeland producer positions available on GERDAC. So EOIs um, are very simple. You just need to put down your qualifications, your interest, um, what you actually can offer the goat industry uh, in those two pages maximum. Um, and how, where you fit within the industry, your knowledge, your expertise, and why you would like to be part of GERDA. Uh, it's a very simple process. You just email it in to Joe Goebbels. The information's there on the screen, and it will be in the recording further on. It's also available on the MLA website. If you type in GERDAC, it will come up. 
but I encourage any rangeland producers in the industry that would you would like to be involved to seriously think about putting in an EOI. GERDAC meet uh, on a regular basis, but it is virtual at the moment. Um, and the opportunities there to actually have your say and, and use your expertise to further the goat industry is a great thing. And it's, it's great to see more people becoming involved in the goat industry. John, have you got anything else that I've missed? Yeah, spot on. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, John and Katie, for presenting for our very first um, speaker of the day for as part of this webinar. Next up, we do have um, two new speakers that we're going to introduce that will actually complement um, John and Katie, who will be back for this second component of the webinar. Our first speaker that I'd like to introduce is Joe Gebbles. Joe is the MLA Program Manager for Sheep and Goat Productivity. He's responsible for developing the strategies and delivering research, development and adoption activities nationally for improved productivity and profitability of both the sheep and goat industries. Um, so John's, uh, sorry, Joe's going to be talking a little bit about the, what MLA does with our investments. Um, and then building on top of this, we're going to have Rob Barwell from Animal Health Australia. Rob is a, a veterinarian who's worked in Australia, England, and Hong Kong before joining with the Animal Health Australia in 2012. Rob manages livestock biosecurity and animal health projects with a focus on endemic diseases. He's passionate about working with Animal Health Australia members to make positive changes in animal health and welfare on farm, which will benefit Australian livestock industries. So this next session that we have in our webinar is all about insights into the goat levies. It's quite common to get a lot of questions at events and field days to kind of understand where the levies are going and how they show investment across the industry. So this goat levy supports our research development and extension, as well as services and best practice information to producers to help um, secure a future which is innovative, profitable and resilient so that Australia remains one of the world leaders in goat production. Katie Davies is going to, to kick us off um, and she'll detail, detail the levy and how it's collected and distributed. Then we'll have our representatives of, from MLA, Animal Health Australia, and then we'll have Katie who's representing the National Residue Survey tonight as well, because each of those three organisations receive a portion of the levy. Um, so it's really important for you as industry participants to understand where your levy goes and how that's invested. So Katie, if, um, if you want to jump in very quickly to start with a bit of an overview, um, you did just touch on it, but if we can have a quick little refresh, that would be great before we jump over to, to Joe and then to Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm sorry, I probably didn't go into enough information about the levy earlier. So. As I said, the transaction levy is made up of 37.7 cents and is payable on every transaction uh, that is made. And that levy is payable to the levy revenue service. Don't be scared of the thought of paying a levy. If you're transacting that goat, it's your responsibility as a member of the goat industry to be paying that levy. Very simply done through LRS, through registering and then submitting your uh, levy return can be done on an annual basis. I did have in the slide the monthly process, but if you go to agriculture.gov.au and you type in levy, uh, it will come up and very simple steps to walk through. There's screenshots explaining the whole process to you. Um, but I just really wanna reiterate that it is a transaction levy. It's not a slaughter levy. Um, there seems to be some confusion in industry but it is a transaction levy. So whether it's property to property uh, or it's to a processor or to a sale yard or it's on the box uh, or through a registered goat depot, just like your NVD, if it goes with an NVD, it's required to have a levy paid. They go together. So ensure that you're keeping your NVD up to date, making sure that the data on the NVD is correct and that you're also paying your levy and um, supporting the goat industry going forward because levies will support your industry to grow and ensure that we all have a healthy business model to go forward with. So thank you for that, Mel. 
No worries at all. Thanks very much for that insight into the um, the goat levy. Joe, if you wanted to kick off with your um, presentation about what MLA does with the, the levy funds that they receive from the goat industry, that would be great. Thanks for the introduction, Mel. And thank you to John and Katie as well. Hopefully you can all see my screen in front of you now. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick rundown of the MLA GOAT program and give you a bit of an insight into some of the key activities and priority areas from a research development and adoption perspective, but also from a market marketing and market access perspective as well. So just to reiterate, as Katie and John mentioned earlier, MLA sits as a service provider to industry and is responsible for actioning industry priorities and consulting with the industry, um, making investments across the research, research and development and the marketing and market access space as well. So again, the levy is a 37.7 cents transaction based levy. Um, MLA received 16.7 cents for R&D, 10.5 cents for marketing. When we look uh, at that as a total budget for 2022-2023 financial year, we've got a total budget of around half a million dollars, which is invested across MLA's key, uh, key pillars and key, key programs. So our livestock is the biggest single investment pillar uh, for goat levies. And we see that around about 300,000 of that $500,000 is invested in the research development and adoption space with the remaining $200,000 invested in the marketing and market access space. So just wanted to give you a quick overview of a couple of key projects and priorities that we have in the research development and adoption space. And that includes uh, selection, breeding and management programs and advancing those for the goat industry. So that's focused on things like reproductive performance, genetic improvement, and also animal health uh, and welfare programs as well. Uh, the second priority there around goat industry sustainability and contributing to the industry-wide goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. And then the third one, and this is a real a big and important priority area for us, is industry engagement, knowledge and capacity building. So just wanted to share a good example of this, which is the Kids Plus program, which is recently launched in partnership with the University of Queensland. Uh, and Kids Plus is essentially a five-year benchmarking program, which is looking to work with a minimum of 15 commercial goat producers across extensive, semi-extensive and intensive goat production systems, and really look into what levels of reproductive performance are we seeing across those enterprises. So that's looking at things like the scanning percentages, weaning percentages, growth rates, and ultimately through to lifetime reproductive performance that's achieved, and really will give us an, an idea over the five years that the program will run of what level of performance is being achieved how variable is it and then from that we hope to be able to make some further investigations to improve the performance of those enterprises so really encourage you to um, jump onto the kids plus web page which is accessible through the mla web page um, and find out a little bit more about that program because i think it's going to be a really exciting one over the next few years uh, Another key priority area, and this is one that we had a recent terms of reference around, is um, parasite management. So we had a, a terms of reference to conduct a review of parasite management and control in the Australian goat industry. Um, I'm sure that this is an issue for many of you on the call this evening, but the purpose of this review is to look at products that are available to goat producers currently, um, consider some of the issues surrounding off-label use, the procedures for their use, and also some of the risks associated with the use of, of products off-label um, to evaluate some of the pathways and potential costs around bringing more products to market or improving the access to uh, additional products, but also to think about what the non-chemical control options are as well. And there are some good existing materials on non-chemical control through uh, module nine of the Going Into Goats Guide. So I'd encourage you to um, have a look at those materials if you're not already familiar with them. We also run a lot of activities such as the webinar that we're on this evening to try and engage the goat industry. So we run webinars, workshops, field days. We've also got the Goats on the Move e-newsletter, which I'd encourage you to subscribe to if you're not already, as well as a, a series of other events in partnership with the, other, with the other commodity groups. So I'd encourage you also to have a look at the MLA events page, which we try and keep up to date with um, key events relevant to your regions. From a marketing and, and market access perspective, 
So the goat industry slaughters anywhere between uh, a million and two million head of goats per year, and it varies based mostly on the seasonal conditions in the major goat producing regions of the country. And we typically see carcass weights sit somewhere between 14 and 16 kilograms, although they've increased in recent times with a return to favourable seasonal conditions across some of our major production areas. From a, a, a price perspective, when we talk about the over the hooks indicators for this, if we look at a, a five year average goat carcass price, we're sitting on around $7 a kilo, whereas the two year average is sitting closer to $8 a kilo. So whilst we are seeing a little bit of volatility in terms of goat prices, I think we're in a really strong position in terms of the demand environment and that's feeding through to some really healthy price increases. So. In the last financial year, 2021-2022, we saw exports, uh, the total value of exports close to 160 million Australian dollars. As Katie touched on a little bit earlier, we do see the vast majority of the production in Australia um, sent to the export market, somewhere between 90 to 95% uh, of goat meat is exported in any given year with the domestic market obviously making up the remainder. If we look at the um, broader global goat meat production and export um, perspective, we can see over on the left-hand side there that Australia is actually a relatively small producer of goat meat on the global stage. We only produce about 0.4% of all goat meat produced around the world. But when we look at the value and the volume of uh, goat meat that's traded on the international markets, we're actually the biggest player, both in terms of volume, but also value as well. And we make up about a third of the overall um, volume and value trade around the world. So we are a big player from that perspective, really with Kenya and Ethiopia as the, as the second and third key producers and exporters from that perspective. So if we think about some of our key markets around the world, the USA is the single biggest market for us. 64% of all exports go to the USA market. Um, and we're seeing some really strong and positive trends in that market. Another key markets include Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, South Korea and Taiwan, which have both had really positive uh, growth in recent years. And, and then of course the uh, domestic market as well. So when our um, in-market teams look at the individual markets and think about where is most attractive to invest the marketing dollar, what they're looking at is the ability for us to impact that market. So it's looking at how good is our access, um, you know, what are the potential pathways for us to um, improve that situation. And then they also look at the market attractiveness. So how much scope have we got for longer term growth there as well? And that really will help us to inform what the strategy is in each of those individual markets. So when we profile out some of our key and uh, key current and emerging markets on that grid, we see that in the top right hand side there, the US is still a really important market for us in terms of we've got good access to the market and there's a lot of growth potential going forward. So that's really probably priority market number one from that perspective. But similarly, we're also seeing that strong growth in the in the South Korean and Taiwanese markets. And then from the domestic market perspective on the right hand side, we're in a very strong position in terms obviously of our access to that market. And so it's really about protecting it and also looking to see where the growth opportunities are in the longer term. So I just wanted to show you a bit of an example of some of the um, uh, individual market profile um, insights that our in-market teams gather. So what they do is they look at across the market and they think about how goat meat is most popularly consumed in those markets and what are the key attributes that consumers look for for goat meat. So in South Korea, goat meat tends to be consumed in speciality restaurants. It's seen as a, a product that has a, a clean and green image and one that's seen as having good health attributes as well. So those insights help to inform the marketing strategy in that given market. And so from a South Korean perspective, we leverage the True Aussie goat brand very heavily. And also again, reiterating some of the attributes around um, uh, production and quality standards and also that clean green image that the Australian goat meat has in that market. From a, a, a domestic consumption perspective, we do see a little bit of variability, but as I said, it's a, a fairly small component of the overall consumption, somewhere around 5% and a little bit of variation between years. We do find that amongst Australian consumers, goat meat is a fairly niche protein. 
uh, and is something that um, consumers level of awareness is quite mixed about and so our key strategy in this area is really to encourage people to give goat a try and raise their awareness of the eating quality attributes of goat meat so a lot of the focus from a domestic perspective is about looking at some of those pathways that consumers are most likely to consume goat meat through such as food service or special events and tapping into promoting goat meat through those sectors. So just to summarize from a markets perspective across the board globally we're seeing a really um, strong demand for high quality protein um, including including goat meat. Um, we have strong demand in each of our major markets and, and, and we have a, a really good market access position with each of those markets as well. So whilst we are uh, a small producer on the global scale, we are a major exporter and we actually find that in most instances supply is more of a dominant constraint um, than demand, which I think is a really positive situation for us to be in. Um, and really, I think in terms of our long term success, it's really protecting our existing markets, focusing on quality, food safety, particularly with reference to residues, and also trying to build the consistency of supply to iron out some of those um, peaks and troughs. I'll finish up there. Thanks very much. And happy to take any questions at the end. Back to you, Mel. Thanks very much, Joe, for that insight. Next up, I'll be passing it over to Rob Barwell to give us a bit of an indication to what Animal Health Australia does with their levies. Thanks, Melanie, and thanks, Janelay, for uh, having me on this evening to talk a little bit about Animal Health Australia and who we are. Um, so Animal Health Australia has been around for about 22 years now. We're a not-for-profit company that facilitates innovative partnerships between governments, livestock industries and other stakeholders for the funding and management of animal health programs. Uh, we work to improve animal health, emergency preparedness and response, biosecurity, market access, livestock welfare, productivity, and food safety and quality. We have uh, actually 33 members, not 32 as uh, it says on this slide, uh, with the recent addition of Australian Wool Innovation. Our categories of members are all the governments, both Commonwealth, state and territory. Um, there is also 14 um, livestock industry members, that, that's the peak industry bodies, including the Goat Industry Council of Australia. We have some service providers, uh, as well as associate members, including Meat and Livestock Australia. Our vision is a national biosecurity system that provides every opportunity for Australian agriculture to, to succeed at home and overseas. And we do this by working with government and industry to deliver, deliver solutions together and enhance, strengthen and protect animal health and bio, the biosecurity system. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick cook's tour of a few of the things um, that I mentioned before and that uh, we include in our projects and things that we do. Firstly, in the emergency preparedness and response space, uh, we're the custodian of the emergency animal disease response agreement. Um, so I think John mentioned earlier, uh, there's obviously been a lot of interest around emergency animal diseases, uh, particularly lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease recently. So we have the ADRA in place, which covers prevention, preparedness, reporting and response obligation, obligations and arrangements and cost sharing arrangements for these two diseases, as well as over 58 others. We also look after the OSVET plans, which are the, a series of public manuals that set out the agreed national policy and guidelines for agencies and organisations involved in the response to an outbreak. So if we were unfortunate enough to get something like foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease, the, uh, the plan is already in place for helping us to approach how we'll actually manage that disease if it hits you. Uh, so for all the diseases listed in the APRA, there is a, 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 an OSVET plan to accompany them, as well as various other manuals. Uh, we also have an emergency animal disease training program, which pr predominantly uh, involves face-to-face uh, -face and virtual training for our members. There's also an emergency animal disease foundation online a uh, course which anybody can do if you want to learn more about what might happen in, in, in these situations, as well as the National Biosecurity Response Team. Um, AHA also looks after 
a couple of important vaccination banks, so foot and mouth disease and anthrax. AHA also has a significant role in national surveillance programs. Many of these are coordinated through the state and territory departments uh, and include uh, such programs as um, the National Arbovirus Monitoring Program, TSC surveillance, so that might be better for TSC. It goes, might be associated with a scrapie, luckily not in Australia, uh, screwworm fly and various others. We also have a number of biosecurity projects. Um, some of you might have come across the Farm Biosecurity website, which is a collaboration between Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia with all things biosecurity, so videos, manuals, declarations, and all sorts of things that producers can uh, download and use there. Uh, we have biosecurity planning and implementation. Uh, we also, oops, sorry look after the Parabos programs um, at the moment, along with University of New England, MLA, AWI and Dorbitz. And obviously you'll be hearing from Matt Playford very soon about parasites. So I won't talk any more about that one. Um, and we also have a small goat health project, uh, which recently has uh, reviewed and revised the goat map program that some of you may be aware of. And that has included the addition of Capri and arthritis encephalitis as a new module. And, again. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the welfare space, a, a small area for Animal Health Australia, but one thing that we have done along with GAICA is the Australian Industry Welfare Standards and Guidelines for Goats, available on the website that I've listed there now. Uh, this is voluntary, um, but is there for all to see. And we also support GAICA in improved welfare for the industry, e.g. looking at increased use of pain relief. And that's our website. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Rob, for that insight. It's great to be able to join the dots and the linkages with what's being done across different portfolios and groups across the goat industry. Um, next up, we have Katie Davies, who will be just talking a little bit about the National, national Residue Surveys um, that are conducted. Katie, are you with us? Yeah, Mel, just give me a yep. minute. I've internet issues, won't you, Sec? Hang on. No, that's fine. If your bandwidth is struggling, um, feel free to leave your video off. That might be able to help. Can you guys see that? Yes, perfect. The slides are up. Great. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, so, NRS, this is the component, part of the component of the goat levy. NRS is a really important um, sector of our industry. Um, they manage the risk of chemical residues and contaminants within animals and plant products in Australia, and they support our status for clean, green food uh, by facilitating the access to our domestic and export markets. Um, seriously important part um, and really um, important part of the levy expenditure. So the GOAT program uh, has been operating for over a decade. Six cents of your levy heads into the program and involves testing of <clears throat> GOAT tissue samples for pesticides, veterinary medicines and environmental contaminants. Um, NRS also maintains the MRLs, which is the maximum residue limits um, that apply for Australia and our major export markets. So the analysis results are checked for compliance with our standards uh, and the relevant MRLs. Um, NRS also has an auditing program that is facilitated by OSMATE. Um, and through that process, there's random audits undertaken within the goat industry in different sectors, whether it be the registered goat uh, depot sector, whether it's the domestic market, whether it's um, the incorrect use of uh, or poorly completed um, NVDs. Um, there's six different sections that the um, OSMATE partner with NRS and in that partner with the goat industry to underpin our compliance within this sector of the industry. 
So some key points is that we are doing really well um, industry leaders with 99.33% compliance to Australian standards. So this underpins our claim of clean green protein, which is part of the red meat sector marketing tools. Um, and also the NRS quality management system is actually certified. So it's an iOS, as you can see there on your screen. So this is where this six cents goes to. If you Google NRS, um, it'll come up under the agricultural department. Um, also Osmate, as I said, are partners within this industry in supporting the processes going forward of those audits. But if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. Um, like I said, uh, really underpin that process for the goat industry, making sure that we don't have detections of our food going out and underpinning our market access uh, worldwide, but also those detections in our domestic market. So all Australian consumers are really confident in the process and the product that we deliver in Australia. So thank you, Mel, back to you. Wonderful, thanks, Katie. It's great to know that we're in nice, safe hands. Um, and it's great to know that the levies are being invested really valuably across the whole industry, which is great. Um, so thank you very much for Rob, Joe and Katie for that insight into where the levies and the levy funds are going, it's wonderful. Next up, we have our third component of this webinar. We're very fortunate to have Matt Playford here. Matt is an experienced livestock veterinarian parasitologist. Um, and he's also the director of Doorbucks, a company that runs a parasitology lab and conducts research on behalf of livestock industries. Matt graduated in veterinary science from the University of Sydney in 1986, and then worked in rural practice until 1989 when he undertook some research at Hokkaido University in Japan, completing a doctorate in parasite immunology. He's taught in livestock medicine and managed a large animal teaching practice in the University of Queensland, before working in R&D within corporate pharmaceutical companies and as a veterinary consultant before he founded Doorbucks in 2009. I'll hand over to Matt now to give a bit of an insight into animal health in the goat industry. Thanks very much, Matt. Great, thank you, Mel, and a big thank you to MLA and Geica for inviting me to present tonight. So I'd just like to uh, focus on that key word, sustainable. What does it mean? Do you have a sustainable? And that, that really means to me, is it a farm that's going to be still operational in the next five to 10 years, or for some reason, uh, isn't able to continue functioning? And worm control is a key part of that. For example, if you are drenching your goats more than four or five times a year, you might be thinking this, I just can't keep this up. Or if you are losing goats to worms, that might be a reason why that farm is not sustainable. So let's try and look at the difference between the farms that are really good at worm control and those that aren't. And we're going to find a few of the answers as we go through this presentation. So first of all, let's talk about vets and particularly your relationship with your vet. And I drew this little diagram and apologies for the, uh, for the artwork to just show a little Venn diagram to show that the things that you know about goats and the things that your vet knows about goats are both very important, but they're not necessarily the same. There are a lot of things that you know about goats, about farming, about your particular goats, including feeding, management, nutrition, production, that the vet doesn't know much about. And conversely, there are a lot of things about diagnostics, uh, disease control, vaccination, immunology, and pharmacology, that your vet knows a lot about. And so you need to work as a team to be able to satisfy the regulators for um, uh, legal compliance and also for the best outcomes for the health, welfare and productivity of your goats. So let's look at, first of all, drenches and some of the key issues about using drenches to kill worms in goats. And the first one is, and this may surprise you, the drenches may not kill the worms. 
Now, this is due to two key factors. One is the goat's metabolism, which tends to um, work over drenches very quickly, and also worm resistance. So when the drenches were first registered, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, they killed the worms fine, but in the intervening years, the worms have developed resistance. And that's because drenches, every time you use a drench, they select for resistant worms. So the more often you're using the drench, the less effective it becomes. The other thing is that drenches may cause residues and Katie has already outlined the fact that the National Residue Survey is constantly monitoring our goats to see if there are residues in the products. Now, little known fact, most of the residue violations are caused by drenches. So this is a major risk area that we need to be aware of. The fourth thing is drenches can make the goat sick. Several ingredients are toxic if they're overdosed, even in small amounts. And this is particularly important for smaller goats and younger goats. And the fifth thing, and I don't want to dwell on this, but it's important that we recognise that drenches are illegal to use. And when I say illegal, there is um, federal and state legislation that requires us to use all drenches, all animal medicines, according to the label. Now, because when we use drenches for goats, they're off label. And I mean off label almost all the time, because even when we're trying to use the right drenches, the dose rates are different from the ones specified on the label, so that makes it off label. So we need to have our vets involved to legally prescribe those drenches. Okay, well, let's move on now that we've established the ground rules. We're not going to rely solely on drenches. We're going to use a lot of other weapons against the worms to understand it. So the overall impact is having a full armory to, um, to aim against our target enemy. So we're gonna play the worm game and we're not going to let them dictate the turns. So the first thing we have to understand is goat metabolism. Now, what does that actually mean? What are the key features of goats that are different from other livestock? Well, the first thing is you've probably um, all observed this, goats like to put their heads up to eat. They love to have a browse on trees, bushes and shrubs. And that's because they're very smart animals. They know that most of the worms in the paddock are down at the foot of the grass sward in the bottom five centimetres of the grass and in the soil. So the goats to avoid the worms put their heads up and they like to graze on things that are above the ground. Now, this is all very well and good if they've got a lot of things to graze, but oftentimes we put up fences to keep the goats away from the trees and the shrubs, and we're forcing them to eat grass. Now, the, the more grass they eat, the closer they get to the ground, the more likely they are to pick up worms. So there's our first clue. Grass is not good for goats and fences are not good for goats. Now, you can understand this by the fact that uh, when goats were first domesticated, they were um, herded by um, people who used to roam across the vast steppes of Central Asia, and they'd only return back to the paddocks a year after they were grazed. And so all the worm larvae on the grass would, would die out before the goats got to graze again. Now, we're putting goats behind fences and we're forcing them to regraze paddocks that are full of worm larvae. And so that stacks the odds in the worm's favour. Another thing that we need to uh, be aware of is the goat's body weight and more importantly, their body condition score. And the only way to properly understand this is to actually put your hands on the goats and feel their backbone, feel their short ribs and actually give them a condition score. Now this has been worked out uh, and it's widely used in the sheep industry. So you can use the, um, the resources that are available for body condition scoring, use and sheep uh, and adapt that to the goats. And we know um, that goats that are on a good plane of nutrition that have got a 
bit of body condition score and, and they're gaining weight, the young goats are able to better survive the worm challenge. Now, the other thing I'd encourage you to do, and apologies that this is a, actually a sheep picture, is from time to time, have a look at the goat's um, eyes. This system is called Farmachar, and it is taught in Australia by um, several people, including Dr. Sandra Baxendall, and also in the New South Wales DPI by Dr. Kylie Greentree. And it's a very useful way of assessing if the goats have uh, anemia, which is often caused by barber's pole worms. And you can see the, the big difference between a nice pink lower eyelid as demonstrated in the sheep here, and a very pale, even slightly jaundiced lower eyelid in this sheep here. Okay, so the next area that we need to be aware of is worm biology. And what I mean by that is understanding things like larval development. There are uh, a few major types of worms that we see very regularly throughout the goat rearing areas of Australia. So the ones that like the warmer weather, such as uh, black scour worm and barber's pole worm, have an ideal larval development temperature of 27.5 degrees. And they also have an ideal humidity or, um, or uh, moisture content of about 60%. And that means that right now with our uh, spring weather, it's ideal conditions. It's never been a better time to be a worm. But don't think that the worms go all quiet in the wintertime because we can see the development curve goes all the way down to 12 degrees, even for barber's pole worm and the other worms much lower. And there are black scale worms down in Victoria and Tasmania where their ideal larval development temperature is only 13 degrees. So they're much more active over the winter. And so the goats pick up larval worms 0.7 millimeters long on average from the grass and dirt. So all through your pastures, there's these worms that are worm larvae that are so small you can't see them with the naked eye. But believe me, we've done counts in our area from goat paddocks and we found up to 50,000 larvae per kilogram of dry matter of grass. Now, what does that mean? Well, your average large goat eats about a kilogram of dry matter of grass per day. And if they're picking up 50,000 worm larvae, they're gonna get very sick. Okay, so what happens when those worm larvae are on the pasture. This is a picture of a dewdrop on the pasture and there's the worm larvae sitting there waiting to be eaten by the goats. They go into the goat's mouth and then they get swallowed down their esophagus, the worm larvae molt, and then they find their place in the goats. And so as the goats are grazing, it doesn't matter if they're eating uh, off the ground, um, or if they're eating um, grass up to uh, 15 centimetres high, they're going to be uh, eating worm larvae as a matter of course. Now we can learn a few things from dairy goats and it's, um, it's uh, no small wonder that a lot of the dairy goat operations now in Australia and New Zealand are moving towards zero grazing. And talking to the people who have overseen the move from uh, grazing dairy goats to zero grazing, whether they're in sheds or in feedlots, they've seen the number of uh, goats that get sick or die decrease dramatically, and they've seen production nearly double. And so thank you, dairy goat industry, for, for sh shining a light on how we can actually increase the health and productivity of our goats by separating them from the source of worms. Okay, what happens next? Well, the worms grow to adult worms inside the goat's stomach and intestines. And different worms have different um, sites that they like to go. They meet their partners, they breed, and they raise families. And for example, the homonchus worm, the barber's pole worm, Female, once she's pregnant, she can lay 10,000 eggs per day. So that's every single worm there could be churning out 10,000 eggs. So it's small wonder that our paddocks become very, very contaminated. And once the worms 
grow to adults in the intestines, they start to either interfere with the uh, goat's digestion and their absorption of nutrients, or they start to suck blood. And we can see here some uh, barber's pole worms in the abomasum, which is the fourth stomach, and that they're, they're all sucking blood. Now, each barber's pole worm will suck 0.05 mil of blood per day. So once you start getting these sort of numbers, you can see that very quickly, the goats will uh, start to lose blood cells, which they can't easily replace. It takes a long time for them to uh, recreate the blood cells and they will become anemic and also suffer from bottle jaw. So thanks to Jeff Cave, so anemia you can see by very pale color in their third eyelid or in their lower eyelid. And the bottle jaw is simply where they have a soft fluid swelling underneath their jaw, which is caused by low blood protein from all the protein that they're losing out of the bloodstream. Okay, so the adult worms in the gut lay eggs that are passed out in the dung pellets. Now, this is a really convenient thing for us because it means we can take a sample and we can look at it under the microscope. So before the eggs hatch, while they're still sitting in the, in the dung heap, we can actually take a sample, wait for the goats to, uh, to pass fresh samples, because we need to get them when they're less than 10 minutes old, otherwise we get an uh, inaccurate result. So get some fresh samples from the goats. How long do these um, larvae survive on pasture? Once the, uh, once the eggs have hatched? Well, it really depends on temperature. The hotter it is and the drier it is, the shorter period of time those larvae are going to survive. So we can actually make rational calculations on how dirty our paddocks are, depending on the worm egg count of the goats that were in there and how long since those goats were in there. And if you want to read more about this, please look at the Worm Boss web pages and they'll give you chapter line and verse on management of paddocks to avoid bad worm problems. So to get a worm egg count, you just collect a handful of fresh dung. Now it's best to do this about once a month. Fresh samples um, that are freshly voided and while they're still warm, you can collect them into a, into a bag, make sure you have the name of the animal and the date. Talk to your lab about uh, su um, submitting them to the lab and um, you'll find that there's a good selection of accredited laboratories with um, a Parabos WEC QA certification and you can be confident that the samples that are processed will give you rigorous and consistent results. And this is uh, pictures from the lab at Dorbitz and there's our conscientious team processing your samples now. Now, a lot of people use McMaster worm egg count chambers. That's a traditional method in Australia. And there's also a mini flow tech, which is an Italian worm egg count chamber not really necessary for goats, but it's used mostly in Europe um, and in some other places around the world for uh, more um, sensitive worm egg counts. And then there's other methods that use machine technology to do automated worm egg counts. And the other advantage of submitting samples to a lab is that they can do other tests. For example, they can identify what type of worms are present by doing a larval differentiation, or they can tell you if your drenches have worked or not, and if your fluke treatments have worked or not by doing before and after uh, counts on both worms and fluke. Now, I mentioned before automated methods for doing worm egg counts. One of them is the FECPAC machine, and this is distributed in Australia by Dorbitz, and it uses technology to actually get a, a vision of the sample with the, you can see nematodirus eggs there in the middle and the strongyle eggs around the outside floating to the top. It takes a photo and that's sent off for analysis to do a worm egg count. 
Now, there has been MLA-sponsored research on the FECPAC machine to validate it and make sure it works. And if you want to look that up, that's available on the MLA website, v.goa.0130. Now, the FECPAC machine isn't the only automated system. There is another one called Parasite that is available. So you might be able to look that one up as well. Now, using worm egg counts, it's very easy to monitor the worm burden of the goats. So simple way of looking at it is if the worm egg count is low, the goats are okay, they don't need treatment. But if the worm egg count's high, it means there's a lot of worms inside the goats and they are likely to be affected, whether it's um, subclinical disease that you can't see that only affects their production or clinical disease. So here's a typical report from a lab. You can see there's four goats here, mini willow, tilly and mambo. And the date they were tested, you can actually put in um, the previous treatment if they've had a treatment. But you can see here that the worm egg count is generally pretty low, 70 eggs per gram, 35 eggs per gram, zero eggs per gram for good old tilly and Mambo also has 70 eggs per gram. Now, what's a high worm egg count? Well, we have seen them 10,000, 20,000 and more. We don't like to see that because we know not only is it, does it mean that the worms are affecting the goats, but also the paddocks are gonna be very badly contaminated. We'll go through that in a bit more detail, but the good news is there are drench decision guides in the goat worm boss that help guide you through your drench decision. Now there are a lot of drenches that we use for sheep and sometimes cattle that people use on goats and I can't tell you which drench to use because that is the um, sole responsibility, the legal responsibility of your local vet who's actually seen your goats and they can make a decision and advise you on the drench to use and the withholding periods to observe. Now, I don't make the rules here, but for some reason, that's the way it's, um, it's panned out, that uh, regulation of drenches is done through vets. Now, there are also other options, including copper oxide wire particles. Now, these aren't registered for the treatment of goats, and so using them for, I uh, beg your pardon, for the treatment of worms, but they are used for copper deficiency. And so if you use them for the treatment of worms, it's an off-label use, and you need also to get um, the okay from your vet. So what do you do if you've got a lot of um, goats in a paddock and they've got a large number of worm larvae continually contaminating the paddock? Another option that is used by a lot of goat producers is biowormer. And it may, it may actually be a bit expensive, but it does actually reduce the larval burden under the right conditions by up to 70%. So for people who have um, goats in confined areas, that may be an option. Now, the other thing to remember about worm egg counts, if we count the worm eggs after treatment, we can tell how well the treatment worked. And here's an example of a report from our laboratory that tested one, two, three, four, five different drenches. And there were five groups of goats. The ones that were treated with Albin 14 days later, they still had an average of 4,380 eggs per gram. Now, the, that's not very different from the pre-treatment count. So we can say that Albin hasn't worked. Levamazole also hasn't worked. Placantel hasn't worked. Avamectin hasn't worked. And even Cydecan, which is quite a strong drench, hasn't worked, or it's worked at about 50%. So we can see that this particular farm isn't having much joy using drenches. This isn't unusual. There's a lot of farms sharing the same problem. And until you actually test your drenches, you won't know. So please talk to your vet about getting a drench resistance test done. Now, the ideal time to do this is 14 days after treatment. 14 days isn't the, uh, isn't the only time you can test um, goats uh, 10 days after treatment. And you really want to work out the percent reduction that each drench is giving you. And the note that it's different for each species of worm. So if you're not getting a worm 
ID done, you won't know the resistance status of your worms in on your paddock. So again, uh, this is a result from our lab and you can see that we'll give you a report showing the drench efficacy or the percent of worms killed by each drench uh, by each type of worm that's present. So if you look, for example, uh, across the top, we can see different types of drenches. A BZ is a white drench, Levamazole is a clear drench, Clisantal, Abamectin, Moxidectin, and Monipantal, which is Zolvix. You can see the Zolvix has worked at 100% against all three types of worms. It's off label use, it was directed by the vet. Uh, Moxidectin worked 100% against nodule worm, but only about 70% against the barber's pole and the small brown stomach worm. Abamectin killed all the small brown stomach worm, but not the barber's pole worm. The Vamazole killed all the barber's pole worm, but not all of the small brown stomach worm. And B, uh, the BZ, the white trench, killed only 12% of the small brown stomach worm. 78% of the barber's pole worm, 100% of the nodule worm. So I hope that gives you some insight into the resistance status of the different worm species. It's different on every farm, and it's particularly bad on places where they buy in a lot of goats. So when you do buy in goats, make sure they get a quarantine drench. Quarantine drench, the definition is in the Worm Boss website, and it means you have to drench them with four different active ingredients including one of the new ones. Keep good records of all your drenches because you need to actually have records regardless of what, uh, what type of goats you have because you need to know the withholding period. And legally, all goats in Australia are classified as food producing animals. And so you need to actually have an assurance that we don't have any residues going to enter the food chain. Now, other ways of managing worms in goats is to breed, select the goats that have resistance to worms, and that means they have uh, innate immunity. They won't allow worms to either establish, develop, or lay eggs inside your goats. So it's a, a great idea for look, to look for um, breeding animals that have innate resistance to worms. And the other thing is, if you feed goats uh, supplements, particularly those with high protein, they will develop resilience to worms. They may still have worms, but they'll have less impact from those worms and be able to survive them better. Okay, so how do we go about managing goats that don't have access to brows and they're just on paddocks all the time? Well, the solution really is. Um, low stocking rates and preventing contamination of those paddocks so that they don't develop into worm farms and they continue to be goat farms. So I'd encourage you all to look at the, uh, the Worm Boss pages for uh, control programs for Australian goats. And we have different ones for smallholders or extensive um, goat producers including drench decision guides and pasture management guides. Other resources, Joe's already mentioned the Going Into Goats Parasite Control Module 9 in the MLA publication. And we also have the CSIRO and MLA publication on goat diseases, the Farmer's Guide, uh, which was produced by PERSA in South Australia. So I'd encourage you all to not just think of worm control as meaning treatments or drenches, but to also think of paddock management, flock or herd management, the tools and knowledge about goats and worm testing and diagnostics as your essential partners in worm control. The take home messages, monitor the goats, look at their eyes, look at their dung, Look at their body condition score and their weight and any changes. Do your worm egg counts and get worm IDs done so you know which type of worm are present. Make a whole farm plan, map your paddocks and know the risk of each paddock. Use all the tools available. Don't just think 
that the drenches will give you the solution because they won't. And work with your vet so that when you do need to choose treatments, you can do it in a way that is legal, compliant and good for the industry. And I'm wishing you all the best for your sustainable farms. Happy to take any questions when question time comes. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Matt. That was a really great insight into goat and parasite. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for tonight's webinar and officially open the Q&A session. We've had some great questions that have come through, but I would encourage all of tonight's participants to, um, to put any questions that you do have into the Q&A chat. So that's just down the bottom um, next to the participants. There's a Q&A with a little question bubble. If you type on that and, um, sorry, click on that and type in any of your questions, I'll now ask all of the speakers if they can, um, if you've got the bandwidth, take the, your, open your video up and we can have a bit of a Q&A session with our webinar participants tonight. I might kick off this Q&A session um, with a wonderful question that's come in in regards to, sorry, I'm just pulling it up here. Um, oh, apologies, guys, I've just lost that. Um, in regards to a bit of an update on the goat levy, Anita asked, there's been talk about increasing the goat levy to help assist with more research and development and further to grow the goat industry in Australia. Could they please get an update? So handing that one over to um, either John or Katie to answer, please. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Anita. Um, happy to answer that. Um, the levy in any industry is set by the producers. So any levy uh, change um, needs to have a comprehensive consultation process. This will take time and money. Um, so it's a case of watch this space. It will take uh, multiple years to do. Um, and at the moment, uh, we're busy with other things, but um, I think futuristically as uh, we develop uh, the plan, uh, there will be a comprehensive consultation process with producers to see where that lands. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. I had another Q&A question come in from um, Nalini. It was just about the going into goats module nine um, guide that Joe mentioned. And I think Katie, you just wanted to add a little bit to it. I have added in the chat function for anyone that's interested the MLA link where you can find all of our amazing going into goats modules that are very useful. Um, but Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Uh, thanks, Mel. Um, yeah, everyone, just to um, reiterate to everyone with regards to tagging um, in the goat industry. So there's, um, as you all know, uh, you have NLIS, which underpins our traceability system for LPA in Australia. And the tagging requirements in the goat industry uh, seem to be a bit confusing for some people. So I just thought I'd run through it very quickly for you. Everything needs a tag unless it is a harvested rangeland goat, which has a tag free movement option. Now those option is only in two scenarios. That is direct from property of capture to slaughter or direct from property of capture to a registered goat depot. So anything else, uh, whether it's property to property uh, or if you're holding it on, on, on your own place and you're going to sell it in two weeks to your neighbours um, or you're going to hold it on your place and you're going to sell it to the abattoirs in two weeks, it needs a tag. So the tag free movement option only available in the harvested rangeland sector and it's very specific rules around the harvested rangeland sector. The harvested rangeland is captured from a wild state. It hasn't had any animal husbandry practices employed on it. So it's not pinching them out of the state forest through properties up. It's not finding them in your paddock um, in non rangeland areas. Um, it's a specific harvested rangeland. Um, also, so anything else requires a tag. Also, just to give everyone an update, the dairy goat hock strap will come into force on the 1st of March, 2023. So the dairy goat industry, the miniature industry and the earless industry uh, will have the hock strap available for their tagging uh, requirements. 
And also um, just to remind everyone that movements of animals must be updated on the database within 48 hours of the movement if it's property to property. Uh, if it's direct to slaughter, your abattoir will update, upload that data for you, but it's really good um, learnings and also really good business practice just to check that those uploads have been made for you on behalf of the receiver um, if they're required to do the uploading for you. So that's all I had, Mel. Thank you very much. No, that's wonderful, Katie. I think it's a question that we get asked quite frequently, so it's great to get some clarification around those taggings of, um, of goat. We've got some really great questions coming, coming through the chat, a lot around parasites. I might flick this one to you, Matt. Um, there was a question that came through that they're interested in some lungworms in central Queensland. The vets recently diagnosed them within their herd um, and with the cold winter and rain this year. Can you just elaborate potentially a little bit on, on lungworms? Yes, um, there's a there's a particular lungworm um, of goats that does cause severe problems, and um, we have seen it for some reason more this year. Probably the third year of um, La Nina might have something to do with it than any other year, and it's uh, not easy to fix up. It does require quite a um, quite a difficult uh, you know and um, prolonged treatment regime. Having said that, we have um, proposed uh, treatments for some of our clients and they've gone very well. And so that's something that needs to be done off label. So I can't just say there's a one size fits all answer. Talk to your vet and if they don't know, please get them to contact us because we have um, uh, you know, the specialist knowledge in, in lungworm control. But I, I really uh, empathise with you there. It is a, a major problem this year. Thanks very much, Matt, for clarifying that. Um, we've had another question coming with the, and it's it's a nice, short and simple one saying tags, electronic question mark. John and Katie, I'll, I'll flick this one over to you. Uh, all right. Um, so as everyone um, hopefully has been made aware, the 1st of January 2025 will be the transition to an electronic tagging system across sheep, cattle and goats. Um, the goat industry... Um, is working really hard at the moment in that rollout. Um, and we're very aware that it's not an EID issue, it's a whole of um, supply chain traceability issue um, to ensure that we actually end up with the best process going forward. But the 1st of January 2025 has been announced by the federal government that that will be the implementation date for electronic tagging in sheep and goats. Wonderful. It's a great announcement to make and it's a it's one that I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions moving forward to as we tr transition towards that deadline, but together we'll make it all happen. Um, we've also had some couple of questions come through the chat and I do encourage everyone to keep writing your questions through. They're great. Um, we've had a couple that have come through as part of the registrations as well. So we'll try to make sure that we cover off on both of those. Um, Joe, you touched on it in your presentation, but there was a question that, that comes through in regards to MLA and developing some ex export markets, would you be able to just, I guess, elaborate a little bit on that in terms of how MLA works out its um, marketing insights into developing those markets overseas? Yeah, look, so I touched upon that briefly in the presentation, but in essence, I think one of the key messages is that we've got really strong market access to a number of key high value markets across the globe. Um, the access to the UK market is one that's improving on a tiered basis uh, over the next few years as well. So I think we're in a situation where our market access is already very strong and we have a strong demand environment for Australian goat meat. I think I see um, supply continuing probably to be the major constraint there, but obviously we'll continue to collect those market insights and continue to look at where we're getting the, the best return for that marketing investment. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that insight, Joe. We've had another question come in um, from one of the, from the registration. And it was about how to manage stock with high rainfall. Matt, you, you touched on this before. It comes back to that on-farm management. 
and trying to, to vary some of the diet, but would you be able to just reiterate just a quick take home message for those producers out there that have really struggled on the East Coast with the high rainfall that we've been experiencing and the high worm burden, just a, a great take home for them today. Yes, um, the high rainfall has meant that there are less paddocks available because a lot of them are um, inundated. And so mobs of goats get boxed up. They're in high, um, uh, uh, high uh, concentration in uh, high stocking rates in the paddocks bringing them together. So you're actually uh, contaminating the areas. And um, it's not easy to actually get the amount of um, space that the goats need. Now, that's not just dangerous for um, the worms, it's also for coccidiosis, which is a, a major danger in these wet years. Now, there's, there's no easy solution um, because not only are the, the goats um, suffering because of the um, lack of feed uh, due to um, inundation and the fact that they're in higher, higher um, concentration, but also larval development and survival is ideal under these conditions. So the, the only real uh, way of approaching it is to get the goats away from those um, contaminated paddocks by rotation, spelling, uh, making hay, doing all the things that are listed in the worm boss site as options for um, reducing the larval contamination of the paddocks. And there may be a cause for actually getting them away from the paddocks and feeding them for a while until those paddocks are safe to use again. Great, thanks very much for that insight, Matt, and take home. There's another question that has just come through the, the Q&A from Susan. And it's in regards to, is there any further research or push to see more drenches available to goats and in goat dosage rates? Joe, did you want to kick off in terms of, of research and in response to that question? Uh, look, I'll probably hand to Matt, who's the expert in this space in a moment, but I think um, certainly it's something that's raised as a priority very often. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, we, we have got a... Um, terms of reference which is recently closed that's looking to do a review of the current um, it's essentially a state of play review really understand what the current situation is and what some of the potential costs and barriers are to improving access but I might just um, hand over to you Matt see if there's anything you wanted to add on that yeah thanks Joe and look the bottom line is every farm is different so a, um, a drench that works on a neighbor's place or that's done in the trial may not work on your place. And so I'd encourage you all to actually do drench tests and uh, quarantine drench the goats when they come in to make sure you're not bringing in the, uh, the resistant worms. Now, having said that, um, that's, that's good practical um, strategy if you're getting um, off-label drench advice from your vet. But for um, general use, I, I personally can't see um, drenches becoming available for use in goats. And that's because the regulatory um, uh, environment for uh, goat drenches has become more and more severe and more strict around the world um, as time goes on. And things that uh, were, were registered 30 or 40 years ago, um, that it was a lot easier to get drenches registered then and if we were to do the same registration package for new drenches for goats today, um, it would simply be um, out of reach of the pharmaceutical company. So no, I don't think there, there will be more drenches available on label. Now, that means that you need to actually work with your vet to work out the, uh, both the drenches at work and the dose rates on your own goats. So it's a lot of small research projects that um, places like our lab and other, other labs around Australia can definitely help you with. Thanks very much for that insight, Matt. That's great. And I think you've just basically touched on another question that's come through the chat, um, which was in regards to uh, drenches that needed to be registered for goats and to get the dose rate, et cetera, from your vet. So one of the best bits of advice that we can, I guess, reiterate is to have that really great relationship with your vet so that you can have that working 
um, for you and to know what drenches are going to work for your animals on your farm um, and fit in with your system. So I think Matt's just um, very generously answered a few of those questions that are coming through the chat with your response there, Matt, which is great. We have just um, a couple more, I guess, comments. And this, again, might be one for you to, to probably just touch on a little bit, Matt. It's from Nalani, and she's saying that worm tests are expensive and that drenches are amazingly expensive. I guess it's all um, in regards to the whole system, um, to what is more expensive, whether or not you're you're testing for those animals or whether you're paying for a drench that may not necessarily be working. But Matt, would you like to elaborate a little bit on, on how they come together in the whole system in terms of cost and benefits? Yes, now I, I'm not pulling any punches and I'm not making any apologies. The title of my talk was the sustainable worm control for goats, not the way that's going to make you the most money. And so, yes, um, there are ways of taking shortcuts um, by um, using the same drench again and again or, or you know, um, not doing worm tests but they are not sustainable. If you want to have goats in five years or 10 years time, then you need to actually follow the methods that are tried and true. And that involves testing and using the right trenches. So um, no apologies there. It's just the way it is. Yeah, no, I think it's it's quite relevant and with the way that market prices are at the moment, it's, you know, um, you're trying to optimize the productivity and the health of your stock. So doing those preventative tests can be, um, can be really beneficial and make sure that you're putting accurate um, drenches to account for that if you need to, but those tests can be really preventative as well. I think our, our questions are, are slowly coming to an end um, in the, the Q&A function and we are just running slightly over time, but I would like to thank again, all of our wonderful presenters for tonight's Goat Roadshow. It's been really great to have your insights into how you're playing part of the goat industry and what you're doing as part of it with our goat industry need to know. Um, so thank you very much, John, Katie, Rob, Joe, and Matt for coming tonight. And a big thank you to, as well to our communicators for hosting this webinar on behalf of the Goat Roadshow, which is funded by MLA. If you do have any additional information, please do um, jump on to the, um, or send an email through to the events at Ag Communicators for any follow-up information. This webinar has been recorded and will be emailed out to all of our registration participants, as well as being put on the MLA YouTube channel available for everyone to watch at another time if that's convenient. Please stay tuned for our future um, Goat Roadshow events. So we do love to see a lot of participants at these events. It's a great way for us to showcase what's going on in the goat industry. But for now, have a great night and thank you very much for jumping on.